All right, I will keep going unless the question gets asked. So let's come back to this. Now, what is it that I want to make sure that you guys walk away with today? So what I'm hoping is that you understand from a food perspective, how are these main items in foods, the salt, the potassium, the calcium, the phosphorus, the magnesium, the protein, fats, fibers, and of course, sugar and sugar-like sweeteners. What is the most important take-home when it comes to food? Now, even though I'm talking about these items individually, and it's important to talk to them individually and not as foods, I want you to understand that the principles of this are going to dictate the type of diet that you end up having. So my hope here is, is that you will take this and you will be able to apply this directly to how you eat. So for I'm on the West Coast, it's uh, 12, 17 in my local time. So here it's almost time for lunch. And so if you're going to have lunch, how can you remember these items and how can you start to apply them? So let's dive into it. Sodium or and sodium chloride is the a better name for it, or salt, is interesting because when we talk about the guidelines, even the guidelines get confusing. All I want you to take home from this is very simple. I want you to make sure that you get less than two grams, just less than two grams of sodium per day. So I want you to look at the label and focus on two grams. Don't worry about the 2.4 versus the two gram difference. That creates more confusion than you need to understand. Just focus on the number two. Two grams of sodium, not salt, of sodium is what you're looking for. Now, why does this matter? Because what we end up finding is that what I'm giving you is one or two studies on each topic, because otherwise we'd here be here for weeks, because there are thousands of studies that I've reviewed over the years to come up with this talk. And this talk gets updated all the time as new data comes out. And what's fascinating is, is that over the last decade, the message of this talk still hasn't changed because every study that's come out has reinforced the messages that are here. That's a fascinating test of time to show that what you're hearing today is both laterally and longitudinally a very important message. So when we talk about salt restriction, or specifically we get into sodium restriction, what we're talking about is, is remember the goal is to get less than two grams. And if you start to restrict your sodium, you will find that your blood pressure goes down. In fact, a low sodium diet can be equivalent to taking one blood pressure pill. So if you can get your salt less than two grams, and by the way, where is 90% of the salt really coming from? It has nothing to do with the salt shaker. It's in prepackaged foods. The prepackaged foods are loaded with sodium. And the typical American is getting closer to about five grams of sodium per day. And that's why we're talking here of cutting you down to less than two grams. Now, once again, progress, over perfection. So the idea is, I don't expect you to all be there tomorrow. What I'm asking for is, how can you change today? So almost one blood pressure medication is worth, because a typical blood pressure medication will give you about a 10 point improvement in your systolic blood pressure. And here, you're getting about 8.75. Okay, other things. Stuff that you want to understand is that as you go on a low sodium diet, not only does your blood pressure go down, your protein in the urine is gonna go down as well. And why should you care? Because the number one determinant of how fast your kidneys are gonna decline is the amount of protein you spill in the urine. So if you wanna lower the protein you're spilling in the urine, lower your salt. It's fascinating how just that little change can go ahead and make such a substantial difference in your overall health. So this is an old study, but I still show this to all the medical students, the fellows that I train, because of the fact that I think it's so critical to understand. When you look at an ACE inhibitor, and, and you might've heard names like lisinopril, enalapril, banazapril, anything that ends in a pril is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or an ACE inhibitor. Very, very common blood pressure medication. Now, why is this study so important? Because all of my colleagues who end up prescribing ACE inhibitors, they prescribe it, but they don't focus as much 
on trying to make sure that people are also following a low sodium diet. So what happens here? Well, let's take a look. If you do an ACE inhibitor, and if you do regular sodium, you'll find that you're spilling a certain amount of protein. In this study, it was 1.68 grams per day in the patients they were looking at. But when they switched them to a low sodium diet and used the same dosing, the same dosing of an ACE inhibitor, what they found was that the reduction was incredible. There was almost a 50% reduction happening simply because they combined a low salt diet with a blood pressure medication, specifically an ACE inhibitor, which decreases the pressure on the kidney. So what do you get in return? You get lower protein in the urine. And what do we say about protein in the urine? That protein in the urine is the number one determinant of how fast your kidneys are going to decline. I think there was a comment in the chat. Wait, so he said that the more sodium, the more protein ends up in the urine. Stacy, that is absolutely what I said. The more salt or sodium you eat, the more protein in the urine you're going to spill. Fascinating, right? All right, let's keep going. Now, potassium. Potassium is interesting because everybody either has a love or a hate relationship with potassium. In other words, people talk about potassium like it's the greatest thing ever or it's the worst thing ever. So what's the data and what should you know about kidney disease? So first thing is, is if you have significant kidney disease, then you need to be on a low potassium diet. What's significant kidney disease? Well, as you start to get beyond stage three, specifically in stage four, stage five, potassium matters more because your kidney's ability to get rid of it becomes hampered. Now, why should you care about potassium? Well, what's interesting about potassium is, is if you look at the, the values in your blood, you'll find that on most reports, the range is about 3.5 to 5.5 is considered normal, but some of them is 3.5 to 5. So 3.5 to 5 is the range in terms of milliequivalents. But what you'll find is that if you go lower than that, specifically less than two, you can start to break down your muscles, your heart will go into arrhythmia and die. If you go much above 5.5, your heart will go into an arrhythmia and you can die. So you can imagine that between three and a half to five is this range. And really at five and a half is the upper limit before all those bad things start. So 3.5 to 5 is this range. Now, why am I making a big deal of these very small numbers in terms of potassium? Because if you look at the amount of potassium inside your cells, it's incredibly high. It's way over 100. And the reason that matters is because if those potassium cells, or the cells in your body, if they break, it can flood so much potassium in your blood that you can die. So the question is, is why aren't we all dead? I mean, we move around, we sit in a chair, we can break cells all the time. If our cells have over 130 milliequivalents of potassium in them and they can shift out and all it takes is just a little higher level in the blood, how come we're all not dead? It's because the kidneys do such a remarkable job. There's other things. For example, insulin can do a number of things. It can drive potassium into cells. So there's other mechanisms. But constant maintenance is coming from the kidneys. So if the kidneys are bad, their function is bad, they have a harder time getting rid of potassium. What's going to happen to the potassium is it's going to build up inside the body and it can quickly go over that 5.5 into the 6 range and cause an arrhythmia. So potassium is very critical to understand. So what about people who are not yet at advanced kidney disease? Well, what happens is if you increase the potassium in your diet, tomatoes, potatoes, avocados, melons, um, pretty much every plant out there is an excellent source of potassium. What you find is that you will see improvements in blood pressure, almost half or equivalent to like taking half the dose of a blood pressure pill. So remember, we said cut salt is like taking one blood pressure pill. Increase potassium-rich foods in your diet, that's like 
taking half a blood pressure pill. The effect is synergistic. It's not like it's equivalent to one and a half pills, but combining both of those together, especially if you don't have significant kidney disease, it's awesome because you'll find that your blood pressure is going down. And what did we say was the number two cause of kidney disease? High blood pressure. What was number one? Diabetes. So when we talk about potassium intake and chronic kidney disease, is it any surprise that people 